sorry, last Sunday we had some problem with our microphone, and so you should be able to hear me better now. Uh, make sure it's plugged in correctly. Today we're going to go back to the book of Galatians, chapter 1. And, uh, let's come before the Lord in prayer and ask for him to bless this time as we uh, look into his word. Father, we thank you for allowing us to worship you today. And we pray in Jesus' name that you would open our hearts through your Holy Spirit. Anoint my lips, Lord, that the words that come forward would be your words to us, to edify us, to glorify yourself. Protect us now, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for your support, your prayers. Um, today, uh, we normally do have our fall festival, and if you haven't got the email yet or noticed, I did talk about it last week that we will be having something a little different today, our Fall Family Fun Fest online. And if you did not get the link, uh, to that Zoom uh, online event at 4 o'clock today. Uh, go ahead and please uh, email, text me, um, or text Jennifer, and um, she'll be heading that up. So uh, please come if you, uh, uh, you can do a virtual um, uh, fellowship. Uh, bring your own food. Eat your own stuff at home, and that's the only thing different. There's no big fellowship with you. So online, fall online uh, family fun fest. Four o'clock today, this afternoon, online and Zoom. You'll need a link for that. So if you're interested in joining us, uh, let me know and if you haven't got the link yet. So last Sunday, we looked at the book of Galatians, chapter 1, and we learned last Sunday that Paul, the apostle, was astonished. He was surprised. What was he surprised about? That the Galatian church was turning to what he called a different gospel. A different gospel. Not that there is a different gospel, but they were turning to a gospel different than the one that was originally preached to them. They were preached. They had been told and taught a gospel that we were all taught that salvation is by grace through faith alone. By grace alone. But they were turning to a different gospel. They were being misled. They were being troubled by false teachers Judaizers, they were called, who tried to add Jewish laws and the obedience to Jewish laws to salvation, saying that you need to now follow a kosher diet, that you needed to now, you know, a uh, uh, tithe, you needed to now be circumcised like Jews were. You need to basically become a Jew and live like a Jew in order to be saved. So it wasn't just a salvation by grace through faith alone, but now it's a salvation by grace. Plus, you have to do other things. You have to follow these other laws. That's no longer a salvation by grace once you add things to salvation. And that's what we learned last time. That it's no longer a salvation by grace once you add things to it. And so he was astonished that people were turning to a different gospel. Today, Paul is going to make the case that being what he calls basically a people pleaser, a people pleaser prevents you from following Jesus Christ fully. A people pleaser. People pleasers prevent us become from being a follower of Jesus Christ. See, when the Galatians Christians were beginning to add to their salvation the necessity of following Jewish laws, Paul said in Galatians 1 verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. So Paul knew that adding works, any kind of works, things that you have to do in addition to salvation, that any time you add works to God's salvation by grace through faith, that would put people back into spiritual bondage by burdening them with laws that they were unable to keep just as it was under Judaism before Christ came. No one was able to perfectly follow all of God's laws. And so therefore, it was a burden that they could not keep. And so Paul declared in verse 8 and 9 of Galatians 1, but even if we or an angel from heaven 
should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you have received, let him be accursed. Let him be condemned by God if they dare to preach a different gospel than the salvation by grace alone. See, distorting the good news of grace through Jesus Christ was a serious matter. It put people's eternal destinies in danger by adding works to the salvation by grace alone. And Paul knew that it was this was all caused, this adding to the gospel, of the adding of laws and Jewish laws, that this was all caused by a desire to please men. A desire to please men rather than please God. And so Paul writes now in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. For now am, am I now seeking the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were trying to please man, I would not be a servant. And that's the verse we're going to look at today. See, in verse 10, as we see, while people pleasers, those who want to please people, have an overwhelming desire to please other people, servants of Jesus Christ are different. Servants of Jesus Christ desire to please God and Him alone. See, people pleasers are motivated by a fear of man. Servants of Christ have a healthy fear of God. People pleasers pretend to serve God when they are actually serving themselves. Servants of Christ are serving God by caring about the needs of others, even if it's in private and no one else sees. People pleasers desire approval from others and are bothered when they don't get it. Servants of Christ simply love others and seek only God's approval. And so I ask this morning, as we look and think about our own lives, which one are we? Are we people pleasers or are we true servants of Jesus Christ? And that's what we're we'll looking at more closely this morning. See, the answer to this question, are we people pleasers or are we servants of Christ? The answer to this question is important because people pleasers usually do not make good servants of Jesus Christ. Why not? Because people pleasers cave under pressure from other people. And this explains why those in the Galatian church were abandoning the gospel of grace and adding to it a gospel of works. It explains why they were doing that. See, you have to remember that of all of Jesus' original Followers, all of Jesus' original followers were Jews, Jewish believers. And these Jewish Christians were being harshly criticized by the Jewish religious authorities and their Jewish friends and their Jewish relatives for allowing uncircumcised Gentiles, non-Jews, as believers into their fellowship. They were allowing uncircumcised non-Jews, like you and me, non-Jews, Gentile believers, into their fellowship. And they were being ostracized for that. They were being criticized. They were condemned for that. How can you let these uncircumcised, unclean Gentiles into your fellowship? And they were being harshly criticized for that. And so, because of the social pressure that was put upon them, because of the political pressure that was put upon them, because of the economic pressure was put upon them, because, you know, the other Jews would shun them. I'm not going to do business with you if you don't want to shop. I'm not going to buy from your goods. If we do business with you, I'm going to cut my ties with you because I'm staying away from you because you're a Gentile lover. You allow people into your fellowship who aren't uncircumcised. You're unclean. I don't, I'm going to stay away from you. So it had economic consequences to them, social consequences to them, political consequences to them. And because of all that pressure that was put upon them by, their, by others, they end up compromising the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of salvation by grace. 
So if you understand the context and understand the reason why they gave in this way, because it was, it was pressure. It was pressure from, from, their fellow, from their fellow Jews. They added circumcision just to please their other Jews. They added Jewish laws to the salvation by grace to please other Jews, to avoid further pressure and criticism. But it was all for show. It was all for show. As it says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 12, Paul writes, it is those who want to make a good showing. See that? It is those who want to make a good showing, to put on fake appearances, who want to make a good showing in the flesh, who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. See, they only do it so they won't be persecuted. They only are pressuring people to be circumcised. No, you know, you, you're Gentiles, you know, you're saved by grace, yes, but please be circumcised and please live like Jews so that we won't be persecuted. So we're just going to put on a show for the other Jewish criticizers of us so they won't pressure us anymore and persecute us anymore. And so it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. See, even today, people will be tempted to cave under pressure from those that they respect or those who are influential in their lives. People will be tempted, or even today, to cave under pressure from influential people in their lives. We might have a teacher, if we're going to school, that opposes the Christian faith. And so we start adopting their viewpoint. Maybe subtly at first, but we start adopting and sympathizing with their viewpoint because we want to please our teacher. I mean, they have authority over our grades, don't they? We may have a coach that we admire who uses God's name as a swear word, takes God's name in vain, and we might start seeing ourselves do the same in the games. You know, oh, you know, it's just words. No, it's taking the Lord's name in vain because we want to kind of fit in with our coach. We have, we have a boss that has no reverence for God. And so we end up compromising our own values and our own beliefs because we don't want to get fired or we don't want the boss to think you know, we're different or you know, just, just, you know, making us feel like we're better than him or her. And so we may even have a spouse that has unbiblical views. And so we accept them as our own just to please them. See, that's what people pleasers do. They cave under pressure. They cave under pressure from other influential people in their lives. Because people would rather compromise our biblical convictions than have influential people in our lives look upon us with disapproval. See, we're so afraid of other people's disapproval that we cave under pressure and compromise our biblical convictions. Is that us? Okay, I confess that there are temptations that I have to do the same thing. You know, be sitting in there, a bunch of group of some people who are not believers, neighbors, friends, co-workers, and they say all these things, and you don't agree with it, and you're not going to say anything, but slowly and surely when you're around that circle of friends, you find yourself kind of sympathizing with their views adopting their views, adopting their behaviors. And that's why Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, if I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. I'm not a servant of Christ at all if I'm trying to please man. If I were still trying to please man, Paul writes, I would not be a servant of Christ. You can't serve man and truly Follow Jesus Christ. If you're a people pleaser, that's your God. Because that's the only person that you'll give into the pressure to. That's the only approval that you're trying to seek. And so a desire to please others may cause us, or actually, you that's the second one. The first point is beware of compromising our commitment to Jesus. Beware of compromising our commitment to Jesus 
and his good news because of our desire to please others. Beware. It's subtle. It happens to me. I'm in a circle of other friends, neighbors, relatives. May or may not, some of them even call themselves believers, but they have beliefs that are clearly against what I know to be true and in the, good, in the, in the Bible. Sometimes you're tempted to give in because you don't want their disapproval. And that's what happened in the Galatian church. Because the Apostle Paul stood his ground and did not give in to the pressure from fellow Jews, since Paul did not give in to the pressure to add to the gospel laws or the requirement to be circumcised, Paul himself was heavily criticized for that stand. No, the gospel is by grace alone. If Gentiles are not circumcised, it doesn't change the fact that they're still saved by grace through faith. If they don't eat kosher foods, they don't follow the, the Sabbath laws, it doesn't matter. They don't need to be Jews. They're Gentiles saved only by grace through faith. And the same with Jews. And so since Paul had that view, he stood his ground, he was heavily criticized for this. And this was a costly decision for him. He had put on himself by his stand on this issue. He put on himself the disapproval of many influential people in Jerusalem. People that he used to look up to when he was growing up as a young Jewish man. But Paul knew that if he had compromised on this point, on the point of salvation by grace through faith, if he had compromised on this point, it would have ruined the faith of the Galatian Christians who had been taught the true good news of salvation by grace through faith. So this brings up another reason why people pleasers don't make good servants of Jesus Christ. Why People pleasers do not make good servants of Christ. One, the first reason was because they cave into the, uh, in, uh, they cave into the, um, they cave in to other influential people. The second reason is that people pleasers often will ignore their own hypocrisy. For the early Jewish Christians, one of their issues were the dietary laws of the Jewish religion. And so under the Old Testament laws, the Jews only ate foods considered clean, according to the Old Testament. And they avoided foods that were deemed unclean, according to God's word. And that's what the Jewish diet was. There were unclean foods and there were clean foods. And so they also avoided eating with non-Jews, although altogether, because their foods were not kosher. And because their foods were not considered kosher, they tended not to eat with Gentiles at all. It was considered unclean. But because salvation in Christ is by grace through faith, observing Jewish ceremonial laws was no longer necessary. And so the Jewish Christians began eating, after they became believers in Jesus Christ, they began eating with their fellow believers who were non-Jews. Even though that was not looked well upon when they were formerly under Judaism. Now that they became Jewish believers in Jesus Christ and the ceremonial laws of the Jews were no longer necessary, the Jewish Christians began eating with Gentile believers, non-Jews, because they were all one body of Jesus Christ. We were all one body. But a controversy arose when some Jewish Christians from Jerusalem came and visited Paul and the Galatian Christians. What happened was, when some Jewish Christians from Jerusalem came to visit, Peter, the Apostle Peter, started pulling back from fellowshipping with the Gentile believers that he once used to eat with. He used to eat with them because he says, you're all one body in Christ. We fellowship together even though I'm a Jew and you're not. It doesn't matter because we're all saved by grace. And he would eat with them just like they were fellow believers in Jesus Christ, as we all were. But once the Jewish Christians from Jerusalem came, he started pulling back from the Gentile believers. Galatians 
uh, chapter 2, verse 12, Paul writes, For before certain men came from James, meaning in Jerusalem, Peter was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. See, even they, Barnabas and Peter were led astray by their hypocrisy. See, their actions of pulling back from the Gentiles as soon as the Jewish Christians from Jerusalem came, this made the Gentile, well, think how they must have felt. How would that make you feel if you were a Gentile believer? This made the Gentile Christians feel like they were second-class Christians because they did not live according to the Jewish laws. And so the Apostle Peter, in his desire to please other men, his fellow Jewish Christians, he ended up alienating the Gentile believers he previously ate with. You see what was going on? He pulled away from them. He, he made them feel like they were lepers. He made them feel like they were inferior. He used to have fellowship. Can you imagine if I sat with you, you know, at the banqueting table, and as soon as someone influential came uh, from the conference, then I started pulling away from you. Like you have, you know, a disease. And then I, I would avoid you all of a sudden. What's going on here? You know, why, why are you avoiding me all of a sudden? What, what happened? What changed? Okay, did the gospel change? Am I a second-class Christian? You know, why am I inferior? And so that's what was going on with, with Peter. He was making the Gentiles believe that somehow there was something missing or deficient in salvation by grace because now he would withdraw from those who formerly fellowshiped with. And so Paul pointed this out to him, to his face. Galatians chapter 2, verse 14, he said, But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, that's Peter's name, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Said that to his face. And what Paul was saying was, in other words, Peter, you were fine with eating with the Gentiles believers earlier, but now that you, you are avoiding them after these Jewish believers came, that puts pressure upon the Gentile believers to now live like Jews. Now you're kind of forcing them to say, well, gee, yeah, if I want to be truly accepted in the body, I better start living like a Jew. I better be circumcised and follow the Jewish laws. Why are you forcing them to become like Jews when you know it doesn't save them? When you know it doesn't add anything to the gospel? That's what Paul is asking Peter in Galatians 2, verse 14. Why are you forcing them Though you live like, though you are a Jew, you live like a Gentile, not a Jew, when, when, you, when you ate with them, how can you now force the Gentiles to live like Jews? By avoiding them, not accepting them until they follow the laws. What are you doing? And so he rebuked them. This would clearly negate the gospel of salvation by grace alone. For am I now serving the approval of man? Galatians 1 10, or of God? Am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? What's the answer? Or am I now trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. It comes back to that again and again. See, at face value, maybe you can probably understand why Peter did what he did. Maybe you can understand why Peter did. You know, Peter didn't want to offend the Jewish believers from Jerusalem. He didn't want to offend them. You know, if they think that Jews or the, the Gentiles needed to be circumcised and because they were unclean and because they didn't follow the kosher diet of the Jews, he didn't want to offend his fellow Jewish believers from Jerusalem. So he started separating himself on their behalf from the Gentile believers. And so maybe you can understand why Peter did that. But what Peter did was he ended up compromising the gospel of God's grace by giving the false impression that the Gentiles needed to follow their Jewish laws in order to be fully accepted, in order to be saved. 
That's the impression you need. And so Peter's people-pleasing, his desire to please man, led him to compromise the good news. And there are times where that happens in our lives. There are times that today that we are tempted to do what Peter did. There are times when we, too, can be tempted to compromise our faith or our moral standards in order to please others. There are times when we just feel like it's actually harder to live by God's uh, true word and his standards than it is to just give in. You ever heard, felt that before? Where it's actually harder sometimes to follow what's in this book than it is just to go along and go with the flow and do whatever everybody else wants you to do just to please them, just to not make waves. See, some people have a false impression that, you know, Christians are not to make waves. We're just supposed to go with the flow. If they do drugs, we do drugs. If they cuss, we cuss. If they believe in something unbiblical, we do. Absolutely not. We follow Jesus. You don't just give in, and yet we do. And we're tempted to. One example is when I was selling, uh, after my father passed, he left me uh, a couple of his cars, and I was selling his truck, and we get a pickup truck. And, you know, it's a very simple thing. I've sold cars before. But oftentimes, this is what happens. You sell the car at a certain price, right? And then when you're recording the new owner's name on the title, guess what they always want to do? They always want to underestimate or underreport how much they pay for it, right? So you sell the car for $1,000, they say, well, put 200. Why? So that when they pay less sales tax to the DMV. They always want to do that, right? Never, never fails. And so again, I, I sold the car, and they say, well, when you write down how much you pay, just say 200 or whatever. I said, why? He says, because I don't want to pay tails tax. And what's it to you? He's asked, because it's not, it's not going to cost you anything. Just put down the, the, the false number, and then you'll save us money. Now, part of me right there says, yeah, I understand. You don't want to pay more money. I, yeah, I could give in. But if that's not how much I paid for it, is that truthful? See, the temptation is just to give in. You know, just give in. Yeah, if that's the one I'm going to put, just, yeah, just put down even though it's a lie. You know, it's, it, it's just a little it's the harmless. You know, what's it to me, he said. What, is, what difference does it make to me whether I put zero or a million? It's not going to be any difference to me. I'm the one paying the sales tax, and I want you to write this number. Because I was very tempted to do that. Because I always am. They always want to do that, right? And if I wanted to please men, that's what I would do. I'd say, oh, okay, I guess. It doesn't hurt me, I guess. But I can't just keep doing that over and over again. And so it ended up costing me more money to do the right thing. Sometimes doing the right thing ends up, end up costing me more. And that's fine. Because we're not here to please people. We're not here to save money. That isn't even that important. Whether it costs me more money to follow the law, fine with that. What does it say in uh, 1 Corinthians? What Paul saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7? To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But Paul is saying, why not just be cheated? Why not just let it cost you more than be totally defeated and compromise your faith? Just let yourself cost more. Why not rather be defrauded? Why not rather just suffer wrong? Yes, it will cost you sometimes to do the right thing. But it wasn't really costing me. I was just being truthful. How is it costing me to be truthful? I'm just being truthful. And it ended up costing me more. So be it. At least I know my, I did what I knew what was right. And that's what the temptations are. Those are all kind of little things that happens in our life. Maybe you can think of other examples. That people will just kind of say, you know, what is it to you? Okay, you, you, I'm a Christian too. He could have said, yeah, I, I, I'm a believer too. And no one's going to care if I just put this extra number in there. And we just cave in just to please others. Okay, even if it costs you more, so be it. Why not rather be defrauded, Paul says. Why not just su rather suffer wrong than to go along with wrong? Why not just be defrauded? Let yourself be defrauded rather than defraud by lying. 
It might cost you, but we're not here to please men, are we? We're here to please God. See, a desire to please others may cause us to ignore hypocrisy. That's what I mean. Oh, you know, it's okay. Just write down the, the wrong number. Oh, it's just a, a desire to please others tempted me to do that many times. A desire to please others may cause us to ignore hypocrisy in ourselves. In ourselves. Look at yourself. Okay? We're all good about looking at hypocrisy in others, but notice that those same people never see the hypocrisy in themselves. That's what happened to Peter. He failed to see his own hypocrisy by withdrawing from the other Gentile believers. He didn't see it. He's an apostle. Okay, he's talking about the apostle Peter here. The one who established God's church in Jerusalem. And he didn't see it. That's what I'm talking about. You'll see, you fail to see the hypocrisy in yourself. Everybody sees hypocrisy in everybody else. They like to point that out. But they don't see it in themselves. Because they don't realize they're people pleasing. And if you ask Paul, you're why are you people pleasing? You'll probably say, I'm not. I'm not. I'm just, you know, accommodating my fellow Jewish brothers. Yes, but by doing that, you're telling the Gentiles that they're sub Christian. You're telling them that their grace by salvation by grace alone is not sufficient. To be fully accepted into the body, you need to do these other things. And that's not grace. That's not salvation. And so. Another reason why a person who is a people pleaser is not a good servant of Christ is because we will be blinded to our own hypocrisy at times, as happened to people. The first thing I said was the reason why uh, uh, people pleasers don't make good disciples is because they cave into the influence of, of others, of influential people in their lives. Now, one final reason why people pleasers do not make good servants of Christ is that people pleasers they want to hide from the shame of the cross now think about that people pleasers want to hide from the shame of the cross and when, you, when you hear that you're like, what do you mean by that? the shame of the cross let me explain See, no one likes feeling embarrassed, right? No one likes feeling embarrassed. Does anyone here like, like to be embarrassed? No one likes to feel embarrassed, especially people pleasers. People who desire approval from others would rather die than be publicly exposed or humiliated or embarrassed. But to be a servant of Christ, you must be willing to do what Jesus said Take up your cross daily and follow him. What does he say in Luke chapter 9, verse 23? And Jesus said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. See, the cross was not only a method of execution, because we just think of the cross as, you know, that's what Jesus hung on when he died. That's true. But it was more than just a method of execution. It was also a means of humiliation. Think about it. You could die in many ways. You could just be beheaded. You could be, you know, a sword thrust through your heart. But to be crucified on a cross in public to be hung on a cross in public was the most shameful of deaths. Think about that. A man was, was uh, beaten first. Then he was stripped, naked, nailed by his hands and feet to a piece of wood and left there in broad daylight for everyone to jeer at, for everyone to gawk at, for hours and hours, just hanging there. Everyone who passed by you would mock and could mock and jeer at you as you slowly suffocated to death. And this is how Jesus was put to death. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Looking to Jesus, 
the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. See, Jesus did more than just die for us. He bore our shame and despised it. He was up there humiliated. He was up on that cross shamed and humiliated in public. And he just says, he endured the cross and despised the shame for the joy that was set before him. There was a shameful humiliation that he took in taking upon that cross and hanging there for hours as he slowly died a slow and grisly death. That's the way your Savior died for you. Jesus did it for the joy, it says, set before him. And what was the joy that was set before him that allowed him to endure such shame for our sake? What was the joy that wanted him to despise the shame? What was that joy that was set before him, as it says in Hebrews? The joy was to be with us forever in heaven. That was what he was looking forward to. He knew by enduring that cross, he would be with us forever in heaven. Our salvation, that was the joy set before him. Our salvation, to be with us in eternity in heaven. He looked forward to that more than anything else. And for that, he would endure anything. He endured the cross, he endured his pain, he endured its shame, he endured his humiliation. What shames are you, or what humiliation are you willing to endure for Jesus Christ? He endured shame and humiliation for us. What shame and humiliation are you willing then to endure for him? See, he did that because it was the joy for him was that he knew that he would open the way for us to spend an eternity in heaven with him through the salvation that was achieved by that cross, by his death on that cross. And so because of his great love for us, he endured the cross, it says, and despised the shame. And it was a humiliating death, but he did it for us. He did it for you, and he did it for me. Because you were worth dying for. You were worth dying for. The Apostle Paul knew all about suffering for Jesus. The Apostle Paul knew all about suffering shame and humiliation for the sake of Jesus Christ. He was saying himself, Paul the Apostle, shamefully treated for the sake of Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This is what Paul endured as a disciple of Jesus Christ, willingly, mind you. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, in danger from robbers, in danger from my own people, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the wilderness, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers, in toil and in hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and in thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Why, oh why, did Paul endure such humiliation and shame willingly? Why did Paul suffer so much for preaching the gospel of grace through faith? Why didn't Paul just quit? I mean, he could have just said, you know what, I don't want to share the gospel anymore. Too much. I mean, after I got beaten the first time, that's enough. After I was stoned, that's enough. After I was shipwrecked the first time, that's enough. After I was adrift at sea, after all these things happened to me, one after another, I could have just quit. Why didn't Paul quit? Why didn't Paul just say, I give in? I don't want to deal with this shame and this suffering anymore. He did it for you. That we may know the gospel. And he did it for Jesus. The one who endured the cross and all its shame, and despised its shame for Paul. Because Jesus was worth it to Paul. What Jesus did 
for him, Paul says, I can never repay. You're worth it. And so he did it for Jesus. And he did it for us. And many people oppose the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's why he suffered so much. That's why he was beaten. That's why he was stoned. Because people didn't like what Paul was preaching. They couldn't stand to hear the gospel of grace through faith. You're letting Gentiles in. You're letting people be saved without being circumcised, without following the laws. You're letting people in. We can't stand that. You're sacrilege, you know, you're causing sacrilege in the Jewish faith. And so we are going to put you to death, Paul. And that's why he was treated so, because many people opposed the good news of Jesus Christ. They couldn't stand what he was preaching including the Jews who were greatly offended by these uncircumcised Gentiles being welcomed into God's kingdom. They couldn't stand that. And so Paul knew that some Jewish Christians wanted Gentile believers to be circumcised in order to please their fellow Jews and to avoid being persecuted and ostracized and hated. But Paul knew that he could never abandon the cross. Paul could never abandon the cross. Jesus endured the shame and humiliation of the cross for me, and I will never abandon the cross. I will keep preaching that the cross, the death of Jesus Christ alone, is what saves us by grace alone. I will never abandon that, Paul said. The good news of salvation by grace through Jesus Christ. Even when it meant ridicule, even when it meant suffering for Paul, even when it meant humiliation by his own peers, Paul would not give up sharing the good news. He would not abandon the cross. And so like I said in the beginning, people pleasers don't make good servants of Christ because people pleasers want to hide from the shame of the cross. Perhaps you've been looked down upon at times because of your faith. Perhaps someone found out you're a Christian, some unbeliever, some relative of yours, some friend, someone found out, or some co-worker. Someone looked down upon you, and if it ever happened, maybe you need to share your faith. Maybe people need to know about your faith a little bit more. But if you've been a believer in a while, you'll become time, there will, become, there will come times in your life that you will probably be looked down upon because of your faith in Jesus Christ. One of my college instructors treated me badly because of my faith. He called my faith, what his words were, specious. I had to look that up. It meant superficially plausible, but wrong. That's what that word means. He wrote that in my papers when I would kind of hint that, you know, I believe in Jesus Christ. He would write that in my, my college essays. You are writing specious arguments, superficially plausible, but wrong. F. I don't know if I got an F, but he, he, he didn't grade me very high. A few months after I fit, or before I finished my final year in seminary, I was living as a boarder in a house, and my landlady asked me this question that before I was graduating. She said, what are your plans after graduation? To join the ranks of the unemployed? <laughs> See, apparently she didn't believe that serving Jesus, serving God, was a viable career path. And she's not the only one. Okay, my own parents, when I first told them I wanted to go to seminary, they didn't think it was a valuable career path either. I think that pastors have a tough life. Who wants to be a pastor? And you're living in Timbuktu. Okay? So they're not the only ones. But that's the kind of ridicule. That's the kind of, kind of people who look down on you. And you know what? It's okay. It's okay to be shamed. It's okay to be humiliated. It's okay to be mocked. It's okay to be looked down upon. Because what Jesus endured for us, what Jesus endured for me, is far more than whatever I can endure on this earth. Look what Paul endured to share the gospel in 2 Corinthians. See, if you're a people pleaser, you're just going to say, that's not for me. I'm going to avoid all that. I'm going to avoid the shame of the cross, the humiliation of the cross. No. Embrace it. It will happen. It will come. And that's fine. Blessed are you when you are ridiculed, looked down upon because of your faith in Christ. Fourth 
or am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? That's the question you need to ask yourself. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. People pleasers will be bothered by people's attempts to shame them. They will be bothered by people's attempts to humiliate them for following Christ. Get used to it. Think of what Jesus, whenever you're humiliated or ashamed, you look down upon, think of what Jesus endured. The shame, the humiliation he endured. Think of what the Apostle Paul endured. And think of why they did it. They did it for you. So that we would know the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. And can we do no less than a small part to endure some of the shame, the humiliation that comes with being a follower of Christ? See, we'll be tempted at times to compromise if we always try to please others. People pleasing, people pleasing may make us ignore our own hypocrisy in ourselves. Look at yourself. And if you value, if you uh, value serving Christ, what other people think just won't affect you anymore. If that's what you value, serving Christ. It won't bother you. And if it does bother you, you have to wonder, who are you really serving? You're serving yourself? You want people to like you? That's why you do it? That's not serving of Christ. But when you serve and when you become and you follow Christ, and people humiliate or criticize or look down on you, it won't bother you. Because you're not serving yourself anyway. You don't care what people think. Because you want to please the God who endured the cross for you who bore that shame for you. That's who you care about. That's who you want to please. And it's hard at times. Well, I have to kind of readjust my, my thinking. And I pray the same for you. Father, we thank you that you endured the cross for my sin. You endured the cross for our sin. You bore its shame, Lord. You did it for the joy set before you, our salvation. Your servant, the Apostle Paul, did the same. He endured so much shame and humiliation and suffering for your sake, Lord, so that we may know the gospel, for our sake as well, so that we may hear the good news. And we are so blessed. Help us not to cave in to pressure. Help us not to negate everything that you did on the cross, negate everything that Paul did to, to bring us the gospel by just caving at every sign of, of humiliation or, or pressure from others. Help us not to cave into others, Lord. Help us to see at times when we are not uh, truly living by your word. Help us also to embrace sometimes the shame of the cross. Thank you, Father. We do it for you, Lord, because we love you. Thank you, Father. We pray these things in Jesus' name.